All right. Um, thanks a lot. And it was very convenient um, having Tomoyuki's talk right before mine because this talk very well, I think, complements it. And he's already given a lot of the background. Uh, but I will repeat it again uh, in some capacity. And to start things off, I want to just um, explain what this title is about for those of you who don't know. Uh, and in fact, this title comes from a a uh, well-known survey paper by Vassilom and Pagliazzo from the 1990s um, about average case complexity surrounding the P versus NP problem. And he basically observed in this paper that there are kind of uh, five possible resolutions to the P versus NP problem that have interesting practical consequences. And these are sometimes called Impagliazzo's five worlds. And in order, they are algorithmica, where P is equal to NP. Uh, Heuristica, where P is different from NP, but nevertheless, NP is easy on average. There's Pessyland, where NP is hard on average, but there are no one-way functions. There's Minicrypt, where there's one-way functions, but no public key encryption. And finally, Cryptomania, where there's one-way functions and also stronger forms of encryption, like public key encryption. Um, and for those of you who don't know what some of those terms mean, uh, really the only thing you need to know for the purposes of this talk is that there's quite literally uh, a line that we can draw in the sand here between Pessy land and Minicrypt, where above this line, uh, classical cryptography is, or at least computationally secure classical cryptography, is essentially impossible. For all interesting classical computational primitives, it's been shown that, uh, assuming those things exist, that implies the existence of one-way functions. Um, on the other hand, below this line, at least some form of quantum uh, of classical cryptography is possible because we have one-way functions, um, and one-way functions uh, actually turn out to suffice for a lot of interesting cryptography. Um, so, uh, I guess, what are one-way functions and why are they so important? So, uh, informally, the definition of a one-way function is it's just a function that is easy to compute. So, given x, you can compute f of x in polynomial time. But it is hard to invert, uh, and the way we define that is we say that a polynomial time adversary, given f of x for a random input x, should not be able to generate a pre-image of f of x with better than negligible probability. Um, and as I kind of alluded to earlier, and, and as we saw in the previous talk, uh, one-way functions are widely viewed as the most fundamental primitive in classical cryptography, uh, both because they are necessary for essentially all interesting cryptography in the classical world. Um, but also, remarkably, they're also sufficient for a surprising number of different cryptographic primitives, including things like pseudorandom generators, pseudorandom functions, um, commitment schemes, digital signatures, just to give a few examples. Um, and kind of the goal of this talk, uh, similar to the last talk, is to try and understand uh, what this landscape looks like in the quantum setting where cryptography is not just going to involve classical communication, but where it can uh, perhaps involve quantum states as well. Uh, and in particular, the thing we really want to understand is are one-way functions still actually necessary in a quantum world uh, in order to build uh, these important cryptographic primitives? Or can we perhaps get by with weaker computational assumptions um, that do not seem to require classical one-way functions? And um, in this talk, we're kind of going to focus on actually just one of these um, uh, quantum computational primitives, a, a, a computational assumption, uh, namely uh, quantum pseudorandom states, or um, and actually in particular single copy pseudorandom quantum states, um, which informally it's just a keyed ensemble of quantum states um, with the property that uh, first of all it stretches a a shorter key, so let's say kappa bits to n bits, where n is strictly larger than kappa. Um, it is possible to efficiently generate a state in this ensemble. So given a key k, you can output phi k in polynomial time by some quantum algorithm. Uh, and then finally, there's this computational indistinguishability criterion, which just says that uh, polynomial time quantum adversary A, given a copy of one of these pseudorandom states, cannot distinguish that from a hard random state with better than negligible probability. Um, 
And we kind of like pseudorandom states for three ma major reasons. Um, one is actually, as we just saw in the previous talk, they turn out to suffice for a lot of these really interesting primitives that we care about, things like commitments, uh, signatures, and also some things that we actually don't know how to build using only classical 1A functions, uh, like multi-party computation. Uh, second, they are also actually implied by the existence of 1A functions. So if you believe the, the widely held cryptographic assumption that 1A functions exist, or at least if you believe that quantum secure 1A functions exist, then you should certainly also believe that pseudorandom states exist. Um, and then finally, there is some evidence to suggest that these are actually a plausibly weaker assumption than one-way functions. So, whereas one-way functions are known to imply pseudorandom states, we don't know whether the, the reverse is true. Um, and we have some evidence in most this regard um, that I'm going to try to tell you a little bit more about uh, on this next slide. So, um, before this work, uh, in fact, actually, we only had some in my view, rather weak evidence that um, these pseudorandom states are in any sense more fundamental than one-way functions. Um, and that evidence came in the form of this result of mine from two years ago, where I showed that there exists a quantum oracle with the following two properties. Uh, first of all, BQP is equal to QMA relative to this quantum oracle. So uh, to be clear, a quantum oracle just means a sequence of unitary transformations that can be queried by a quantum algorithm. And so when I say that BQP to the O equals QMA to the O, what I mean is that any QMA decision problem that can be uh, solved by querying this oracle can in fact be solved by a BQP algorithm, so uh, by an efficient quantum algorithm. So BQP equals QMA relative to this oracle, but also pseudorandom states exist relative to this oracle. Uh, and that just means um, in a similar fashion, that there exists this ensemble of pseudorandom states that you can generate efficiently using this oracle, but nevertheless, no polynomial time quantum algorithm that has query access to this oracle uh, can break the security of the pseudorandom ensemble, and in particular, you cannot distinguish the pseudorandom states from hard random states. Um, and hence, uh, the main thing to note about this is that if BQP is equal to QMA, uh, that implies in particular that BQP contains NP, and hence that quantum algorithms can efficiently break all classical one-way functions. So quantum secure one-way functions, uh, one, excuse me, quantum secure one-way functions cannot exist relative to this oracle, uh, but pseudorandom states do. And so this is basically saying that uh, at least in some restricted setting, and in particular in the quantum black box setting, uh, these pseudorandom states really are something uh, more fundamental than one-way functions, because it's possible to have them without one-way functions. Um, but unfortunately, there are actually, in my view, some major caveats with this result, uh, and in particular with taking this result as actually giving rise to uh, some fundamental separation between one-way functions and pseudorandom states. Um, the first issue is that, in some sense, viewing this as a separation between pseudorandom states and one-way functions is cheating. And the reason it's cheating is that one-way functions, as a purely classical primitive, uh, can't actually depend on this oracle O, because they are defined as a classical function. And, you know, arguably you can get around this by generalizing the definition of one-way functions to be allowed to be computed by a quantum algorithm. Uh, but there are yet more problems. So, um, a second conceptual issue with this separation is that quantum oracle separations are in general kind of weak. Um, in fact, it was observed by uh, Scott Aronson in 2009 that there exist, um, there exist containments of complexity classes that actually hold relative to every classical oracle, but that fail uh, in the presence of certain quantum oracles. Uh, and hence, for all we know, the separation here between one-way functions and pseudorandom states could really just be some kind of bizarre artifact of the fact that we're using these quantum oracles and maybe relative to a classical oracle, uh, you would not expect the same thing to hold. Um, and then finally, there's what I think is maybe the biggest uh, issue with the separation, which is that uh, even though this does give us like a black box separation, it does not conceptually give us a way to actually instantiate the separation in the real world. Uh, and in particular, there's no way that you can kind of take this oracle and modify it to plausibly give a secure construction of pseudorandom states that does not directly rely on 1A functions. Um, and intuitively, the reason for this is that this oracle O uh, 
Actually, part of it involves taking literally a, a har random unitary oracle, so a, a completely random unitary transformation. And the problem is that we very much do not know how to model random quantum oracles um, uh, in the real world. Uh, so by contrast, in classical cryptography, there is this well-tested um, well computational assumption that's you know, kind of the, known as the random oracle model, where you have a classical random oracle. So that just means that you prove that some um, cryptographic primitive is secure when you have a uniformly random function as an oracle. And then there's this heuristic you can apply in which you replace that oracle with some concrete cryptographic hash function, like, I mean, it can be your favorite uh, hash function, like SHA-3. And then plausibly, um, this gives rise to a secure instantiation of that primitive um, uh, w without the presence of oracles, like for some, some concrete function. Um, but my point is that we, we do not know how to model these hard random oracles, so uh, we, we don't uh, th this separation here does not actually give rise to any kind of practical separation of one-way functions and pseudo-random states. So uh, that brings me to this work, where uh, in this updated work, uh, what we do is we kind of simultaneously overcome all of these three barriers uh, with this previous result. So in particular, what do we do? Um, we show that there exists a property, a, a security property, of a concrete cryptographic hash function um, that has the following three nice properties. Um, first of all, this security property actually suffices to build pseudo uh, single-copy secure pseudorandom states, and hence, by the, uh, the work we saw on the previous slide, also, or, sorry, by um, the, the, the talks we've seen earlier today, this implies the existence of various uh, interesting quantum cryptographic primitives. Second, we show that this property, in fact, does hold for a random oracle. So if you believe in the classical random oracle hypothesis, you can replace this random oracle with SHA-3 and get a secure instantiation of pseudorandom states in the real world. And then finally, and perhaps most interestingly, we show that this security property of this hash function is actually independent of the p versus np problem. And what this means is that we are able to construct a black box setting in which, in fact, p is equal to np, but nevertheless, the security property holds, and hence, we actually have pseudorandom states relative to this oracle, despite uh, p equals np, and thus no one-way functions. Um, or, you know, in order to, uh, to, to just phrase things slightly differently, uh, if we go back all the way to the first slide, what this is basically saying is that uh, all the way up here, all the way in algorithmica, where p is equal to np, uh, in the black box setting, it is actually entirely conceivable that we still have pseudorandom quantum states, which is, you know, um, like for, for classical cryptography, any sort of interesting cryptography in algorithmica is unthinkable. And what this talk is essentially showing is that this landscape surrounding... Um, Cryptography and the P versus NP problem and one-way functions looks very different in the quantum world. So that's kind of the main takeaway of this work. Um, in the remaining time, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about what this property is and briefly touch on how we actually um, prove that it satisfies these three things we care about. Um, and the property of this cryptographic hash function that we will call big H uh, is the following. And we're going to view big H as con consisting of a bunch of uh, smaller functions. So we're going to have um, for each K, uh, for each key K in 0, 1 to the kappa, a function, or rather a pair of functions, F, K, and G, K, on N bits, where N is larger than kappa. And here's the security property we're going to assume. Um, the security game is that an adversary is given a uh, query access to this auxiliary function little h as a black box. And given this function little h, the adversary must distinguish whether, first of all, uh, h is a uniformly random Boolean function, or second, whether h was sampled in such a way that this function little h is non-negligibly correlated with the Boolean Fourier transform of uh, fk times gk. 
Um, and I will mention that there are some subtleties in how you actually define what the second thing means. So really, um, we have to define like an explicit distributional version of this and uh, explain explicitly like how this age gets sampled in this correlated fashion. But I think for the purposes of intuition, um, th this is all you need to know. And I guess I will also mention that this is sort of in some sense analogous to the definition of classical pseudorandom functions, uh, where you want to distinguish a random and a pseudorandom object but now here, the pseudorandom object is sampled slightly differently. Um, rather than being chosen directly from the, the hash function, this function is chosen in some weird kind of uh, correlated fashion involving a Boolean Fourier transform. Um, so this is the security property we assume. Um, the way we build pseudorandom states out of this security property is actually in some sense even simpler to describe. Uh, the way you generate the state phi sub k is you start in the L0 state, you apply a layer of Hadamard gates, you query FK, apply another layer of Hadamard gates, and query GK. And that is it. And um, for those of you who know a little bit about quantum query complexity, uh, it probably should not surprise you by this point that um, everything I've talked about so far is somehow uh, something related to the correlation problem in disguise. So what is the correlation problem? Um, the correlation problem was this uh, query complexity problem that was introduced by Scott Aronson in 2009, where you are given a pair of Boolean functions, f and g, and you're promised that either uh, f and g are both uniformly random functions, or f and g are sampled in such a way that uh, the Boolean Fourier transform of f is non-negligibly correlated with g. Uh, and in this paper, he showed that this problem is solvable in BQP, uh, and in fact, actually, depending on how you define this problem, you can even solve this problem actually using just a single query to f and g. Um, and in fact, the algorithm to solve this problem is uh, literally the circuit plus like another layer of Hadamard gates and a measurement. Um, so this problem is in BQP. Um, what was interesting about this problem is that it was raised as a candidate problem um, that is not contained in this class called PH, uh, the polynomial hierarchy. And intuitively, pH is like, uh, I guess, the closure of NP under reductions. So it's like kind of a larger class than NP um, that uh, has some nice properties. And um, I think the only thing I will say about correlation that matters for us is that uh, essentially what our proof does is we reduce the security of our pseudorandom state ensemble to a problem called uh, or of correlations. So um, or of correlations just means you're given a bunch of correlation instances, and either all of them are sampled uniformly at random, or there exists a single input, uh, a single pair of functions that were sampled in a correlated manner. Uh, and you have to distinguish which is the case. And uh, importantly for us, this problem or of correlation was shown to um, not be contained in this complexity class BQP to the pH by uh, Aronson, Ingram, and myself last year. And, um, well, I don't know how much more intuition I can give about this, but uh, this BQP to the pH is morally uh, what you get when you take BQP to, uh, when you take BQP and then give it the power to solve uh, NP complete problems for free. Um, and somehow, saying that this or correlation remains hard when you can solve NP-complete problems for free is what it takes for us to conclude that you can build pseudorandom states uh, in the black box setting even if P is equal to NP. Um, so that's everything I wanted to say about the technical details of this work. Um, in my remaining time, I'll just say a little bit about some of our favorite open problems. And... Um, to start off, I think uh, one of the most natural open questions is whether you can extend our proof to the multi-copy setting. So as we saw in the previous talk, you can also define uh, a multi-copy version of pseudorandom states where the adversary, in fact, gets any polynomial number of copies. Uh, and we actually show that under a plausible conjecture about a generalization of the correlation problem called t correlation, uh, you can actually extend our security proof to the multi-copy setting as well. Um, 
Another question is, uh, another natural question is whether you can kind of qu uh, qualitatively improve our oracle separation to one where uh, not just p is equal to np, but perhaps actually even p is equal to QMA. Uh, because then this would really be, um, I, I guess, an, an even more, you know, fundamental separation because it's a thing, you know, not only are, are classical um, NP problems hard, but like the, the quantum, the, the quantum analog of NP also uh, collapses all the way to P. Um, and then finally, uh, the last and, well, actually, no, I, I guess I have another open question that I didn't mention on this slide, but maybe I'll mention at the end. Um, another important open question is whether, uh, or I guess trying to understand what computational assumptions actually are required for these single copy pseudo random states. Um, and in particular, can we relate the assumption that pseudo random states exist to any pre quantum beliefs about complexity theory? Uh, so, for example, could you show something like uh, assuming single copy pseudo random states exist that perhaps P must be different from P space uh, or something along those lines? Uh, that's another nice question. Um, and then finally, maybe the last question that I don't have on this slide, but I want to briefly mention because I think it's interesting, is whether you could actually kind of instantiate um, this oracle separation uh, with some actual function. So could you like perhaps uh, replace these functions f, k, and g, k with some explicit functions that are clearly not one-way functions? Like they, they very clearly fail to be one-way for, for you know, some nice reason, but nevertheless, such that uh, this actually gives rise to a secure pseudorandom state ensemble. Um, that, I think, is the last thing I wanted to say. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. OK, we have time for questions. You, you seem to have some intuition about uh, like different worlds in which pseudorandom states can exist. Like you said, you know, maybe there's a world in which P is equal to QMA, but pseudorandom states exist. And then it seemed like your last open question seems to suggest that, well, maybe if you can't say that for like P equals P space, but, uh, but pseudorandom states exist. So like, what, what is your, where is this coming from? Uh... Well, I mean, this, it's an open question. I'm not saying I, I know the answer. Well, but do you see, I mean, do you have any intuition for why you, you know, you, you phrased it in that? So, okay, like, um, well, okay, I, I guess I, I do have some intuitions that both of these are doable. Um, so I don't really have any reason to believe that, like, our current construction, like, would fail if you tried to generalize this from NP to QMA. So I, I think that should be plausible. Uh, for this last bullet point, so this is closely related to uh, what Scott Aronson likes to call the unitary synthesis problem. Um, and, you know, basically, I believe that you can show that if some, like, p-space effective version of the unitary synthesis problem is solvable, then you would get something like this, that single copy of pseudorandom states would separate p from p-space. So in particular, I think, like, uh, assume p equals p-space, if that implies that um, every unitary transformation whose entries can be computed in P space can be implemented in polynomial time, then I think that would imply that um, pseudorandom states can be broken, I see. even in the single copy setting. Okay. So that's my intuition. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, so um, so can we think of pseudo-random states as some kind of results of a T design? Ah, good. So, uh, no. <laughs> um, so actually, I don't have the definition of multi-copy pseudo-random states here, but... Um, yeah, there are some subtleties. So it is inherently a, a computational notion um, because we are uh, requiring that the, the, the set of states has stretch. 
So it, it has to map uh, a strictly shorter key to a strictly longer n-bit string. And this basically guarantees that actually the, the mixture over states drawn from this ensemble actually has to be statistically far from the maximally mixed state. Um, and actually, analogously, for, for multi-copy pseudorandom states, there's again something similar where, where you can, I think, show that the definition is incomparable to t-designs. Um, so you can have things that are t-designs but that fail to be pseudorandom states, and you can have things that are pseudorandom states but fail to be t-designs. Yeah. So um, I guess t-designs, intuitively, they're sort of analogous to, like, t-wise independent hash functions. So, so, so like, the, the relation between t-designs and pseudorandom states is sort of analogous to the relation between t-wise independent functions and pseudorandom functions in mm -hmm. classical cryptography. I see. Yeah. Okay. Um, but can you also comment on, like, potentially instantiating pseudorandom states or... Like, what, what do you mean? Like, you know, how would you actually, you know, have an algorithm that outputs something that you could call a pseudo-random state? Um, so you have a definition of it, but like, if you were to make it, you know, like... I mean, this... <laughs> this outputs pseudo -random. Yeah, well, so, you know, if... Certainly, if you replace uh, fk and gk by, like, random functions, then this gets gets you something that's, like provably pseudorandom. Okay. Um, and, you know, plausibly, if you replace this by a cryptographic hash function, it, just, it should still be pseudorandom. Um, Great. So, yeah. Just Any more questions? Hi. Thanks for the interesting talk. Uh, do you think it might be possible, um, I mean, can, thinking about the relationship between one-way functions and um, pseudorandom states, do you think it might be possible that um, so for example, um, it, it's perhaps more interesting than something like one-way functions are strictly stronger than pseudorandom states, and like one-way functions sit somewhere in between one copy pseudorandom states and po polynomial copy uh, pseudorandom pseudo -random states. Sorry, like sorry, a bit of an incoherent well, question. Well, yeah, well, like what, what is the question? So, so you're asking like. Where do, do you, I think one-way functions lie? Yeah, yeah. Do you have any intuition about where, where uh, one-way functions lie with respect to pseudo-random states and these different classes of pseudo-random states that you've uh, talked about? That's a good question. I mean, yeah. Well, I, I guess obviously I think that you know in uh, in the black box setting, one-way functions are probably strictly stronger. Um, I mean, I think the the more important question to me is actually how all these different quantum cryptographic primitives relate to each other. Mm. Which is again something we saw mentioned in the previous talk as well, but like you know we don't know how to go between multi-copy and single-copy pseudo-random states. We don't know how to go between a lot of these you know cryptographic primitives, and this is in direct contrast to the classical setting where one-way functions are like a remarkably robust notion. Like there's all these different things that look very different on the surface, but that turn out to be equivalent to one-way functions. And um, at the moment, we don't seem to have that for pseudo-random states. And I think my intuition is that maybe that actually is inherent. Like maybe these primitives really are more different from each other than we think. Um, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks.